We've all heard the old adage that we know more about space than we do about the oceans on planet Earth. That's not strictly speaking true. We don't even really understand how big space is or even how many universes there are, so we can't really know how much of it we've explored or travelled. The ocean, however, is fundamentally finite. We know how much of the surface area of Earth is covered in water, but we actually know very little about our oceans compared to what we know about space. According to NOAA, the ocean takes up 71% of the Earth's space, but a massive 95% of it remains completely unexplored. It's no real surprise that large bodies of water carry such mystery and reverence for people. Water provided a life source for our ancient ancestors as they set up thriving communities on the shores of rivers, lakes and oceans, and they respected the devastating power of the water. Legends of sea creatures and lake monsters, mermaids, sirens and lost cities permeate the narrative of water on Earth. And sometimes, even the lakes that are man-made can spell doom for the inhabitants. Lake Lanier was made in 1956, when the Beaufort Dam was completed in the Chattahoochee River. The lake was created to manage floodwaters and supply electricity and water to nearby Atlanta. The construction of Lake Lanier was not only marred by chaos, but also drove families from their land. The government paid people a pittance for land and eventually over 250, mostly black, families, 15 businesses and 20 cemeteries and corpses were relocated before the land was flooded to create the lake. Callously driving people from their homes and uprooting the resting places of the dead are all part of a recipe for disaster. And for years, legends have circulated that Lake Lanier is cursed. There have been over 500 deaths on the lake since its creation, hundreds of rescues, and 27 bodies that have been unrecovered. Many people report feelings of anxiety and stress when they visit the lake. Some have said that while swimming on the lake, they suddenly feel the tug of unseen hands, and cars have veered off the road seemingly having seen a woman in white. Fishermen have reported seeing shadowy figures rowing a raft over the still water in the dead of night. Year after year, Lake Lanier makes the news as more people tragically lose their lives on the water. But the reality of what is happening here is probably far more logical than supernatural. You see, when the area was flooded, it was flooded exactly as it was. So beneath the dark waters of the lake, there lies homes, businesses, farms, the remnants of graveyards, huge bleachers, and even a racetrack. The lake was never designed with recreation in mind, yet people flock to it year after year to swim, boat, fish, and party. But it's incredibly dangerous. The huge volume of debris beneath the surface of the lake makes it easy for people to get trapped or injured while swimming. People often visit the lake and consume large quantities of alcohol, and there are limited boating regulations to prevent boat misuse on the water. Oh, and there are also seven-foot catfish lurking beneath the surface of the water. Lake Lanier has had a tragic journey, with officials having scant regard for the lives and rights of the people in the area, living or dead, and the natural ecosystem. Today, the lake attracts thousands of people looking for some leisure time on the water, many of whom perhaps don't fully understand how dangerous it actually is. But there are many stories attached to other bodies of water all over the world. Some like the Bermuda Triangle and the Loch Ness Monster are known almost worldwide. But some are maybe not so well known, but are just as strange. Today we're going to talk about two strange stories of creatures of the deep from two very different parts of the world. Leitrim is a small county in the west of Ireland, and it is a place of wild and rural poetic beauty. In a small graveyard in the county is a gravestone that is tucked away from prying eyes, but it tells a rather bizarre story, a story of an ancient beast that may be more than just a legend. The first recorded sighting of the Doer Coup comes from Roderick O'Flaherty in his 1684 book, 
a choreographical description of West Connacht. O'Flaherty describes a bizarre incident that took place on the shores of Loch Mask. There is one rarity more, which we may term the Irish crocodile, where of one as yet living about 10 years ago had said experience. The man was passing the shore just by the waterside and spied far off the head of a beast swimming, which he took to be an otter, and took no more notice of it. But the beast, it seems, lifted up its head to discern whereabouts the man was. Then diving swam under the water till he struck ground, whereupon he run out of the water suddenly and took the man by the elbow, whereby the man stooped down and the beast fastened his teeth in his pate and dragged him into the water. Where the man took hold of a stone by chance in his way and calling to mind he had a knife in his jacket, took it out and gave a thrust of it to the beast, which thereupon got away from him into the lake. The water about him was all bloody, whether from the beast's blood or his own, or from both, he knows not. It was the pitch of an ordinary greyhound, of a black, slimy skin, without hair as he imagines. Old men acquainted with the lake do tell there is such a beast in it, and that a stout fellow, with a wolf dog along with him, met the like there once, which after a long struggling went away in spite of the man and his dog and was a long time after found rotten in a rocky cave of the lake when the waters decreased. The like, they say, is seen in other lakes in Ireland, and they call it the Dor Coo, the Water Dog. On September the 22nd, 1722, Grania Connolly was perched on the shore of Glenad Lake in Leitrim. She was washing the clothes of her family in the lake water, and was a well-known woman in the area, no one will ever know the exact details of what happened that day, but Grania Connolly never returned home, and her husband Terence went to the lake shore to look for her. What he found was beyond anything he could ever have imagined. There, on the lake shore, was the body of his wife, completely torn to shreds, and half consumed. And next to her lay the culprit. Grania had been savagely attacked and eaten by the door coup which was now sun-dozing next to its kill. Terence flew into a grief-stricken rage and launched himself at the door coup, stabbing it in the neck. The creature let out a high-pitched screech, and something about the sound meant that Terence immediately knew that the creature was calling for something. He began to back away slowly as the screeching filled the air, and then it emerged from the water. Her mate another huge water hound, which was as fast on land as it was in the water. Terence mounted his horse and galloped away with the door coup in pursuit, keeping pace with his steed. He rode for miles, and he realised that his horse would not be able to keep going at this pace for much longer. He stopped at the blacksmiths of Cashelgarren and desperately sought assistance. The legend goes that the blacksmith was well acquainted with the door coup and handed Terence a sword. He told him that he must face the creature, but that the creature would go for the horse first, and that was the only way that Terence would have the chance to strike. And that's exactly what happened. The door coup lowered its head and charged directly at the horse, allegedly ripping it in half, and Terence struck it in the head and killed it. The legend goes that the horse and the door coup were buried side by side. But what is more interesting is that you can still visit Grania's grave to this day. And upon her gravestone is her name, her husband's name, and a vivid description of the slaying of the door coup. The creature is depicted lying down with its head and neck flung backwards so that it lies flat along its back in its death throes. A spear-like weapon is shown piercing the base of the creature's neck, re-emerging below its body and gripped by a human fist at its upper end. The most recent encounter with the door coup took place in 2000, when Irish artist Sean Corcoran claims to have spotted the beast while visiting Omi Island. 
According to Corcoran, he was standing on the bank of a lake when he heard an unusual hissing sound followed by a loud splash. As he looked down, he saw the creature, which reputedly swam the length of the lake within a matter of seconds. Once it had reached the shore on the other side, Corcoran stated that it climbed onto a boulder and let out a haunting screech. He was so struck by the experience that he included the story in his map, guide and DVD on Omi Island, which was published later in 2009. There are allegedly a colony of Dorku that live in Trahine's Lock on the Ackle Island in County Mayo, and there have been smatterings of sightings in recent years. It's a legend that has withstood the test of time, and it was a story swapped by storytellers and immortalised by song. But it's not the end of the story. There is some speculation that the Dorku may have actually existed, and was part of a genus of giant otter. Scientists have discovered the otter had a formidable relative that was a predator six million years ago. It was the size of a wolf and weighed about 50 kg, but seems to have existed exclusively in China. But it's a thought. Originally, I presumed that this was an old folk legend that would have had a moralistic message like, don't go too close to the lake shore. But this legend seems to have tendrils that have stretched far and wide. And perhaps, without people even realising, it has deeper connections. But to understand where or what the Dorku is, we first have to pay a brief visit to Loch Ness, because apparently that's where the story really begins. We all know the story of the Loch Ness Monster. A huge creature that many believe is some sort of long-surviving dinosaur that lurks in the waters of Loch Ness in Scotland. The story was elevated by the infamous surgeon's photo, which was later revealed to be a hoax, but it didn't really matter by then. For years, enthusiasts and scientists have tried to prove, and in the latter case disprove, the existence of Nessie. The first ever sighting of her has an Irish connection, and appears in The Life of St Columba, by Adam Nawn, written in the 6th century AD. Columba was an Irish missionary who was travelling Scotland. A man had been savagely attacked by a water beast and was killed. Columba sent a follower to swim across the river. The beast approached him, but Columba made the sign of the cross and said, Go no further. Do not touch the man. Go back at once. The creature stopped, as if it had been pulled back with ropes, and fled and Columba's men and the Picts gave thanks for what they perceived as a miracle. There are those that believe that in revenge the offspring of Nessie were sent to plague the rivers and lakes of Ireland in order to wreak revenge on the Irish people. Now, stories of saints are always to be taken with a pinch of salt, but there seems to be a reference to a sort of curse of the Irish people that implies that wherever they go, lake monsters will follow. There is a saying that the Erie Canal was built by the Irish. And to be honest, it's an exaggeration, as there were other immigrant groups that worked alongside them. However, 3,000 Irish immigrants did make up part of the construction crew. Construction began in July 1817 and was completed in 1825 and from the port of New York City, the canal would connect the Hudson River at Troy, New York near Albany, through upstate New York to Buffalo, Lake Erie and the other Great Lakes. It was a huge success, opening the doors to migration and trade to the west, thanks to the speed and ease of transport the canal provided. It's likely that the stories of lake monsters following Irish immigrants came from people from the west of Ireland who would have been familiar with both the story of the Dorku and the story of St. Columbus, and some people like to perpetuate the narrative. But that fails to take into consideration the fact that native people had been aware of something living in Lake Erie for centuries. It didn't just arrive with the Irish people, although they might have thought it did. Bessie, as it is now known, is allegedly a 40 foot long undulating serpent-like creature, and the first recorded sighting was in 1793 and she's been sighted sporadically ever since, sometimes from a distance, 
and sometimes maybe too close for comfort. Recently, a man named Franklin P. Wainwright wrote to Weird Ohio with the following account. I have a boat on Lake Erie, and I often fish near Vermilion, and I can tell you, there is a monster in that lake, and near that shore. Many people have seen it over the years, and I am one of those people. The first thing I will say is that I know the town of Huron has tried to make money off this monster. They call it Bessie and try to get tourists to come and look for it. I think this is very irresponsible and downright dangerous. The thing I saw was vicious and not to be messed with. Giving it a cute name and trying to get people, let alone kids, to come and search for it is only going to lead to tragedy. I'm a fishing fanatic. I've got an 18-foot Boston whaler that some friends and I use constantly in the summers. Pretty much every weekend or free day I'm not working, I'm out on Lake Erie. Two summers ago, I was out on the lake more than usual. I had just gone through a pretty messy divorce, lost custody of my kid and was in danger of losing my job. I was having a lot of trouble sleeping and found myself spending most of these sleepless nights alone on my boat, either fishing or just cruising the lake, thinking about how rotten my life was. In early July, I was having one of those nights where I was just cruising the lake. I anchored the boat a few hundred yards offshore and was just lying on my back drinking a few cans of beer. As sad as it is in hindsight, I found that the combination of the rocking of the boat and a few beers was one of the only surefire methods of overcoming my insomnia. I don't know how many mornings that summer I woke up fully clothed on the deck of my boat with cans scattered around. It definitely wasn't the happiest period of my life. That particular night, I was awakened from my slumber by something rubbing against the bottom of the boat. The noise and the impact woke me and I immediately heard a noise that I find hard to describe. It was the rushing of water, followed by the slap of something against the surface of the lake. I sprang up and grabbed the lantern, which I always left burning in the bow of the boat, so that no other vessel would plough into me at night. Then I lunged to the gunwale and held the light over the water to have a look. What I saw I will never forget. Before I go any further, let me say that I was not drunk when I saw what I saw. I had been sleeping for at least three hours and I had only had four beers. I'm sure what I'm about to describe is in no way the product of any alcohol-induced hallucination. There was a long, thick creature, a few feet beneath the keel of my boat. All exaggeration aside, this thing was at least 20 feet long. It darted with incredible speed away from my skiff as I struggled to make out its form beneath the inky black surface of the water. When it was about 30 feet away from my vessel, the beast reared its body up out of the lake. Although it was still dark out, it was a clear night with a full moon shining down on the still surface of the water. Because of this fact, I was able to clearly make out a long serpentine body of the animal and its large round head. That was all I saw before it submerged again and disappeared forever. There is no doubt in my mind that that thing intentionally slammed into my boat. The first instinct I had when I saw it was that I had invaded its territory and it was letting me know. Perhaps like a common eel, it had been attracted to the glow of my lantern. I cannot say for sure. But that was the last night I ever spent alone on Lake Erie. I've only gone fishing at night a few times in the past two years and never by myself. Needless to say, the sleeplessness of that summer only got worse after I looked that monster in the eye. Thankfully, since then, my life has returned more or less to normal. I've remarried, I see my kid often, and have a new job much better than the one I was so worried about back then. When I think back to that summer, the only really terrifying aspect of it I haven't managed to reckon with is the mystery of what I saw that night. From ancient plesiosaurs to giant man-eating otters, and from ghost ships to mysterious lights... The sea holds many mysteries, but what is really interesting is the similarities between stories of sea monsters across cultures across the ages. 
you can find similar lake monsters on each continent. So did our ancient ancestors share the land with these fearsome creatures, causing the stories to be passed down for generations? Or do we truly share our waterways with some even bigger mysteries? <laughs>